But back to some examples of innovation, <coughs> of courage, of tenacity, some of which you may have heard about, some of which may be new to you, and hopefully all of which may be meaningful. This is Li Bei, a delightful 16-year-old student in Xinjiang province in China, about two hours south of Beijing. Two months ago, this very healthy teenager developed a sudden onset of terrible headache, vomiting, and dizziness. Clinical and radiologic investigations revealed dramatically increased intracranial pressure, evidently produced by a large cystic tumor the size of a tennis ball seen here in the left frontal parietal area of her brain, dangerously close to the speech center. It just happened that that week, a team of surgeons and anesthesiologists from the University Health Network led by Peter Yao and accompanied by Mark Bernstein, Eric Massacott, and Jacob Lai, were in the region teaching techniques to Chinese surgeons. Mark and his colleagues used methods developed here at UHN to perform an awake craniotomy and resection of the tumor. As you can see here, Li Bei was fully conscious during the whole procedure and able to respond if the surgeons ventured too close to the speech area in their quest to remove the tumor. And here's Li Bei, one hour after her operation sitting up and ready to go home, pictured with a very pleased Mark Bernstein and Jacob Lai. Li Bei was one of six such patients who benefited during that two-week gift of UHN to China and will likely have an excellent long-term prognosis. Over 700 patients in Canada have had similar revolutionary interventions here at Toronto Western Hospital over the last 10 years. A story detailing innovation, the bold, persistent ingenuity of a UHN neurosurgeon in Mark Bernstein, the vision of a dedicated anesthesiologist in Peter Yao, and the global outreach of the University Health Network. Astrid is a 52-year-old woman who 19 years ago at the age of 33 was involved in a car accident sustaining injuries to her left hip and knee. Seven years later, in 1995, she needed a total hip replacement for post-traumatic arthritis. Then seven years after that, in 2000, she fell at home, fracturing her femur just above her arthritic left knee, mm -hmm. leading to an open reduction and internal fixation with the plate and screws you see on this slide. Mm -hmm. If she ever needed a total knee replacement for her arthritis, this would present a real problem because an intramedullary rod is usually placed in the femur to align the bones during this operation, and with all this hardware in place, this might simply be impossible. Mm -hmm. At knee replacement, if the plates, plate were removed, the rod inserted, and the prosthesis put in place, the weakened bones might very well fracture, creating a real disaster for Astrid. In fact, Astrid did come to need a total knee replacement. To avoid that disaster I mentioned, and using novel computer-assisted alignment techniques, as you can see on these slides, Rod Davy was able to insert the new prosthetic knee with accurate alignment without insertion of a rod and avoiding the risk of removing the blade plate. The articular surface mounted computer navigation system produced perfect alignment of the structures and literally by the literally bionic knee is now functioning very well. And Astrid is obviously delighted with her results. This innovation speaks to UHN's willingness to adopt the creative techniques of others, in this case developments through the Stryker Orthopedic Company in the interest of improving safer, more precise patient care. This is often required in complex cases that confound other surgeons, and Rod and Nizar Mohammed have now performed six such cases with satisfying results using the computer navigation system. The next story is that of a man named Brian Gallery, a 69-year-old businessman from Montreal. Brian had the daunting challenge of confronting a brain tumor just above and behind his nose. I can't begin to tell the story as well as Brian did himself at a tribute dinner in November of last year. Let's hear what Brian had to say. The MRI was about a month later. No cancer. Last, this was happening, by the way, two years ago, uh, the 23rd of October. It would be two years ago. I had another MRI about uh, six, uh, three months ago. No cancer, I'm clean as a whistle. In the entire session, well, I think it's the most important thing for me is that I am now able to say to my newest best friend, 
Irishman of the Year. I'm hoping that you'll think about that for him if you have such a thing in Toronto. Well, we're really Irish and a lot of Protestants, but we have a <laughs> And perhaps, perhaps somebody will say that Patrick should become the Irishman of the Year. The personality, the way I was treated, the checking up back, coming up and back to Toronto to make sure everything is okay. I cannot tell you how wonderful and how terrific he was to me. I want to tell you, Pat, that on behalf of myself, I am so grateful to you because basically I think you saved my life. I would also like to tell you, Pat, that on behalf, I phoned up to see, to ask, how many people have you taken care of over the years trying to do the best that you could for them? And they told me thousands. On behalf of the thousands, some are here, some are not, a lot are not. But I'd like to tell you, sir, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for all that you've done, not only for me, but for all of them. You are a wonderful man, and I love you. This story tells us, of course, about the high level of multidisciplinary care provided here at UHM and our responsibility to serve patients far outside our Metro Toronto borders. But it's also a story of compassion, of caring about every patient, about making a patient feel that for that period they're here at University Health Network, they are at the center of our world. With fear of embarrassing Pat Delane, the person who is referred to there, and he, he isn't uh, embarrassed, he loves it. No one, <laughs> no one makes the patient feel more important and the focus of our intention than Pat Delane. And that, in an era of automated medicine in some sectors where patients feel they're on an assembly line rather than in a personalized haven of caring, is innovation. The kind of innovation that is within all our grasps. And just a footnote, Pat's good work was appreciated by Brian Gallery to be sure, but also by another Brian, this one Mulrooney, who is one of Brian Gallery's oldest friends. Linda was a 76-year-old woman who was extremely energetic, active, and full of life until her aortic stenosis and severe chronic obstructive lung disease slowed her to the point she was simply incapacitated. She wanted to live and would sacrifice all to regain some of her former energy. She was deemed too high risk for a conventional aortic valve replacement, so she was considered for a transapical aortic valve replacement, a novel, minimally invasive procedure new to Ontario. The procedure is relatively simple in theory, complex in practice. Through a short left thoracotomy incision, a guide wire is placed through the apex of the left ventricle here, <coughs> into the heart, through the aortic valve that you can see here, and this is followed by a balloon which, when inflated, dilates the stenotic valve. And there it was just dilated. The balloon is then taken out and replaced by another composite balloon and valve apparatus so that when deployed, this fixes a new prosthetic valve against the native valve so that when deflated, the balloon leaves the new valve in place, as you can see here. The patient is then left with closing that small hole in the heart through which the catheter traveled. And as you can see here on the animation from, as viewed from the aorta, a functioning aortic valve and a very small left chest incision. In order to familiarize themselves with the operation, a group of UHN surgeons, operating room nurses, cardiologists, and anesthesiologists traveled to Vancouver, where this procedure had been performed a few times previously. Then a short time later, a group of surgeons and cardiologists came from Vancouver to Toronto to assist in Linda's planned transapical valve replacement. The first part of the operation went beautifully, but the balloon sighting the prosthetic valve malfunctioned resulting in the heart literally ejecting the whole apparatus beyond the heart into the aortic arch. After a few rapid attempts at, <clears throat> at correcting the situation with minimally invasive techniques, Chris Feindell was forced to perform a heroic open operation.